Hello, Device Talkers. This is Kayleen Brown of Device Talks, and I am thrilled to bring you another episode of Device Talks AI. On Device Talks AI, we talk about the medical device itself and how artificial intelligence is being integrated into the device for better outcomes. Today's episode is particularly juicy because it's a double hitter. The first part of the episode, I have the opportunity of sitting down with the president and CEO of Ascensus Surgical to talk through how Ascensus is using artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence for better health outcomes in surgical robotics. My colleague, the very talented Brian Bunts, then will be sitting down with the general manager of Health AI at Amazon Web Services to uncover how that tech giant is supporting the medical device industry. But before we get into the juicy, juicy of the episode, for those who are watching on YouTube, you've probably noticed that I'm wearing a fierce purple suit. This is in honor of, in my opinion, the most successful Device Talks conference to date. We just wrapped Device Talks Boston early last month. That was, oh, I'm reflecting. Again, if you're seeing me on YouTube, you can see that I'm just filled with so much joy and energy. I had the privilege of sitting down with nearly 25 senior med tech leaders over 11 separate sessions. So I was either on stage talking about artificial intelligence, because obviously, or I was behind the camera in the Device Talks recording studio talking to some of the most influential medical device suppliers and supporters of the medical device industry. When I think about the event outside of having the opportunity of seeing my nearly two decades long friendships, I had an opportunity to feel like a person again. <laughs> I'm laughing when I say that because I have a one and a half year old and this was the first time that I was across the country from him. So I couldn't jump on a plane, a train, a taxi cab and get home if he needed me. And that was a struggle. I'm not going to lie. It was, it was it was a milestone for me. The other side of that is I got to be me again. I got to be the medtech millennial. I got to stand on stage with some of the brightest minds in the industry and be completely reinvigorated. It was a really important reminder that I chose the medical device industry because I love it. So thank you, Tom, and thank you for everyone who attended Device Talks Boston. You made it the best yet. So the big news, Carl Stortz acquires a sense of surgical. Could this episode be timed any better? I think not. So this is a perfect opportunity to really understand what was so appealing about a sense of surgical and why a huge organization like Carl Stortz would invest so much into acquiring them. My co-worker, Sean Woolley, has the skinny. I've dropped in the show notes a link to the article that gives you the what what, so please take a look. But that leads me beautifully into the first interview where I have the pleasure of sitting down with Anthony Fernando, the president and CEO of a sense of surgical. So first off, Anthony and I talk about the difference between augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence. And those are two very big differences. And I highly encourage you to take a listen to help maybe make artificial intelligence a bit more approachable because it really is about providing more opportunities, not taking opportunities away. We also talk about the Sea Hands and Luna surgical systems obviously. And then most exciting for me, we dig into the Intelligent Surgical Unit, which is the world's first real-time augmented intelligence platform available for intra-optive use. We dig in that and more. After my interview with Anthony, my talented colleague, Brian Bunts, who's now the editor-in-chief of R&D World and Drug Discovery and Development, sits down with Tahseen Syed, the GM of Health AI at Amazon Web Services. 
the two of them really discuss Amazon Web Services' mission, and in particular, the need or the desire to help organizations leverage powerful AI capabilities without the need for extensive technical assistance or technical expertise. So before I dig into this juicy, juicy episode and finally begin, I did want to circle back to the Device Talks recording studio that was on site at Device Talks Boston. So at that studio, we recorded along with our editorial director, Tom Salemi, and another talented coworker, Amira Weinecker. We recorded the first suite of Device Talk Spotlights. We sat down with some of MedTech's best to solve the, some of the problems in MedTech as many as we could get to in two days. I personally had the opportunity of sitting down with Chad Rohr of Advanced Sterilization Products, Matthew Heidecker of PSN Labs, and Cassie Hoppers of Vantage Medical. I dropped that link in the show notes, so please take a look. If you have a particular problem as you are making your device, there perhaps is a solution there. And we'll be continuing to build that library. So do check in at least weekly and you'll see new content. But that was an absolute thrill. I got to be behind the camera, which is one of my favorite places to be. And I wanted to remind you that Device Talks AI, though one of my favorite per- <laughs> podcasts is one of many. So the Device Talks podcast network is home to MedTech podcasts. We have 10 and here's some exciting news. We're launching three new podcasts, one in July, one in August, and one in September. They say time flies when you're having fun. How is it already Christmas? (laughs) With that, if you're interested in structural heart stroke or clinical trials, make sure to subscribe to Device Talks on every major podcast platform and on YouTube. That's the only way you're going to get access to that those new podcasts when they come out, as well as access to the entire Device Talks podcast network. We have new episodes of Striker Talks and Abbott Talks coming out. And of course, our weekly podcast, Device Talks Weekly, with the incredible one and only Tom Salemi. Okay, enough about all of the exciting Device Talks happenings. Let's dig in to our first interview. Anthony Fernando, President and CEO of Ascensa Surgical. Take it away. Anthony Fernando, President and CEO of Ascensa Surgical. Welcome to AI Meets Life Sci. I'm so pleased to have you here today. And I am teeming with questions. But before we get into my question after question after question, can you give us a 40,000 foot view of Ascensa Surgical? Uh, perhaps your Synhance, uh, your Lunar Surgical robotics platform, just giving us context before we dive into augmented intelligence. Sure, Kaylin. Hey, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, so really quick, uh, Ascensa Surgical is a, a, a digital surgery uh, technology company. And, and we are really focused on digitizing the interface between the surgeon and the patient uh, in order to drive uh, predictable uh, and improved uh, outcomes uh, for the patient and also with some benefits for the surgeons. Uh, like you said, you know, Senhance and, and Luna, they're robotic uh, platforms. So we leverage uh, robotic manipulation, uh, software algorithms that has AI and machine learning and, and data analytics uh, combined uh, to deliver uh, this digital uh, surgery that we uh, also call performance uh, guided surgery. So that's in, in, in a nutshell, that's who we are and and, uh, what we strive to do. Excellent. So before we dig into how augmented intelligence is enhancing the performance, I want to go back to kind of the inception of a sense of surgical was the idea of using artificial slash augmented intelligence. And I say it like that because I know we're going to differentiate that here shortly, Uh, but was that always an idea in mind to help guide the technology or did that come later? I think it was uh, maybe a little bit of both because I think we kind of tend to overuse the word, the the abbreviation AI and and artificial. Uh, 
uh, quite a lot. Uh, but in, in reality, you know, when you think about surgery, it, it's a pretty high stakes uh, uh, area where you really have to have a lot, lot of knowledge uh, and experience because you're dealing with the, uh, with the human life. Uh, and, and that's very, very critical. Uh, so that's the reason why we tend to use the term augmented intelligence, because we are trying to provide uh, the surgeon with a level of augmentation. So the, the surgeon has better knowledge, a uh, uh, higher level of uh, experience, and even uh, uh, give the surgeon a level of uh, higher confidence uh, in order to perform versus trying to uh, dictate to the surgeon about what should be done or even for the surgeon to be hands off where a machine kind of takes over. That's not the intent here. Uh, so for us, augmented intelligence is, is really about how can we augment the surgeon so that the surgeon can perform at the highest possible level, uh, irrelevant of their level of training or number of hours or years of uh, experience, uh, they can deliver the best possible outcome uh, for their patients every single time. So then would you say that augmented intelligence is kind of a companion maybe to the surgeon's practice? As you, I think you had mentioned before, less about kind of directing it, but more of a compliment? I, 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 yeah, I think so. Because I think, you know, when, when you think about a surgeon, the surgeon can't, perform his or her duties by themselves. They have a team, right? It's a surgical team with several uh, uh, people in the operating room, uh, you know, surgical assistants and, and nurses who help the surgeon perform this surgery. So you could think about augmented intelligence being a digital assistant uh, to the surgeon so that it's, it's always there and it is the same level of support that the surgeon is getting. It's, it's consistent. Uh, you know, some of the experienced surgeons and, and surgical teams, they are so synonymous. The, the assistant and the surgeon, they, they really can, uh, you know, predict what's coming next and, and complement each other very well. And, and what happens when that assistant goes on vacation? Uh, now the surgeon has to get used to working with somebody else. And that's kind of when things don't go as well in the operating room. Uh, you know, things could be, take longer. Now here with the augmentation of the surgical procedure uh, with a digital assistant, now you have a level of consistency every day, irrelevant of what the patient is and irrelevant of who the assistant is supporting the case. The, the assistant, you know, don't get me wrong, the assistant plays a very significant role and will continue to play a significant role. But this kind of normalizes uh, the two, two sides of the surgeon and the surgical staff and kind of engage them into the act of surgery as one team instead of discrete individuals performing the surgical task. Uh, and that's that's really the power of the, the technology. Well, this way of thinking about augmented intelligence feels a lot more approachable. Uh, one of the lessons that uh, my co-host Brian Bunce and I have really learned over our time with AI Meets Life Size, there is this barrier to uh, adopting, and I'm using the overused generalized term artificial intelligence to make my point, there's this uh, barrier and um, this sort of resistance, and I say this generally, this res resistance to adopting it, but using a softer form of it, uh, augmented intelligence and thinking about it as a digital assistant. And again, it's not replacing anyone. It's not replacing that important position, but it's producing a more, a re not reliable, a more consistent uh, support that feels right. like who wouldn't want that? What surgeon, what what care worker wouldn't want consistent support that they can rely on as they move forward for better patient outcomes? I'm going to be peppering that in 
So I have heard, Anthony, augmented intelligence used more often. Uh, in fact, I had done an interview with Ben Newton's GE Healthcare. He's the GM of oncology over there, and he uses augmented intelligence a lot. Is this terminology something that had come in maybe in the last couple of years to help differentiate the differences between artificial intelligence, or has that always been around and we just weren't aware of it? I think the term has been around for quite some time, but I, I, I think it's becoming more and more obvious, especially uh, in the healthcare setting, uh, where the stakes are high, like I stated before. So the word artificial doesn't quite uh, get a lot of traction uh, given the risk profile uh, of surgery. So as a result, I think the augmentation or augmented uh, intelligence tend to be more relevant uh, in the healthcare surgery uh, space, uh, thus, you know, kind of becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, like you said, you know, it's, it's big, big, definitely something, uh, you know, if I were to go back, you know, four or five years when we started our digital surgery journey, you know, we started talking about augmented intelligence because that was a conscious decision. And, and this was the, the, the point that you're bringing up is something I had to explain every single time saying, oh, you mean AI? And I'm like, yes, it's the same abbreviation, but I'm talking about something uh, different. And then that took a while. But now when I hear about this topic from other uh, companies, they, they do tend to use the augmented intelligence uh, phrase more often. So I think it's found its place in, in, uh, in, the, in, in surgery. I have to agree with that. Again, I'm seeing it now more and more and more. So let's shift a little bit and talk specifically about the Intelligent Surgical Units or the ISU. Can you give us an overview of really what that is and how that works within your existing product line? Sure. I mean, that that's really the, the brains behind uh, the real-time uh, context that we provide to the, the surgeon. It's a significantly high-powered uh, computer with a, a real-time graphics engine uh, that's able to see the surgery while the surgery is happening through the endoscopic video and it processes that image uh, in less than one frame uh, so one thirtieth of a second uh, it will process that image and it, it gleans a ton of insights from that image uh, to be able to identify certain tissue, instruments, the state of the surgery, which, which stage is the, the surgery uh, at, in order to be able to provide the surgeon uh, some suggestions, recommendations, uh, and also offer tools. So it's, it's a real-time uh, image processing engine that can interact with the surgeon and provide uh, feedback and also provide some tools. For example, uh, if the surgeon wants to measure a certain uh, part of the anatomy and uh, be able to uh, take out a certain margin, let's say a three centimeter margin, it, it's just a flip of a button, a click of a uh, button on the interface and now the surgeon can measure in real time in 3D space and can get this uh, data uh, in real time. So that's also part of this uh, image uh, uh, processing and machine learning uh, algorithms that deliver uh, these kinds of uh, digital tools. And also, if you think about what the ISU can do is we have a, a large database of uh, surgery that we uh, observed over the years and we've identified best practices and what good looks like in a specific procedure. Now, this has been fed back into this ISU. So it, it has a deep knowledge uh, of tens of thousands of good surgeries as defined by surgeons. Uh, now, that can be uh, offered to the surgeon in real time uh, to say, you know, I've seen this is what good looks like. Do you want to follow this? Pathway. So that, that's what the ISU does. It's, it's just a, 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 a real-time uh, image processing, image analytics, uh, machine learning uh, device 
uh, that offers uh, insights uh, to the surgeon. So we were talking about your intelligent surgical unit and how it really complements your system and how it can complement the surgeon as well as the rest of the care team. What would the, what has the regulatory pathway looked like for that? Because I know that's very intimidating. Is like, how do you build medical devices, robotic systems in particular, and how do you take it through the FDA pathway? And I know that you had gotten an FDA clearance and I think it was September of 2021. So maybe you can take us there and kind of walk us through whatever you're comfortable sharing with our audience. Sure, Kellen. I think for, for us, there are two, two parts to it, right? We originally started with the, with the robotic platform and then we added the ISU uh, onto the robotic platform. Uh, and the, the robotic platform initially got approved in uh, 2017 uh, and we leveraged uh, European uh, clinical data uh, in order to uh, demonstrate uh, the product's uh, feasibility. And then fast forward to 2020 is uh, when we uh, received the approval for the ISU. And, and we believe it's, it is the first uh, real-time uh, machine vision AI device that got approved for surgery. Um, so that, that took some effort. Uh, because it was something unique, something new, uh, new for us, and also even uh, talking with the uh, FDA and some of the European agencies, we tried to understand uh, what they are going to look for, and then we provided uh, those proof points and uh, uh, testing and data in order to demonstrate that. Uh, so since then, we've, we've had multiple iterations and different uh, software versions and additional features, etc., that we've added to the platform. Uh, and, and it's kind of, I, I think there's a relative learning curve on both sides. We are also learning from the agency about what they like to see more of, because as you know, things like cybersecurity is becoming an increasing prevalent. Uh, issue for everybody so that standards is, is changing and we kind of need to keep up uh, and then at the same time we are also sharing what we are seeing and, and hearing uh, from the technology front uh, with the FTA so I, I think you know, with the FTA we have a very collaborative uh, uh, relationship and we've had that for uh, many years uh, and, and that's kind of the pathway so we are focusing on a, on a traditional 510k uh, pathway uh, continuously for the robotic platform and for the ISU and for the combined device. It is a traditional 510k pathway. We have 510k for the Senhance platform and the ISU and in, in the future with the Luna uh, platform we are uh, going to follow that uh, same pathway because we become our own predicate uh, device. So uh, one, thank you for walking us through that history. It's really important to understand what has been done. So you had mentioned kind of your first step into the pathway was in 2017. I mean, how did you, did you, did you consult with other organizations that really understood augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence to, to, to help craft what that would look like? I mean, it just seems like in 2017, there wasn't really any even vocabulary around it. And again, I'm coming from a very different perspective. So uh, how, how did you know how to move forward? And how did you choose 510K as the pathway? Yeah, yeah I mean, it, again, it was in, in discussion with the agency. Uh, we talked to them about what we were planning to do. And then we also had several... Uh, data points uh, of uh, not so much of medical device, but other regulated products that leverage machine learning and machine vision uh, to provide as a feature. Uh, so we, we looked at those, we, we talked about them, and, and then that's kind of how we agreed on a, uh, on a path forward. Uh, but we did look at reference uh, devices uh, that exist uh, mostly on the diagnostic side 
uh, you know, uh, imaging uh, uses some of these uh, uh, augmented intelligence tools. So we, we looked at the entire ecosystem and found certain parallels uh, and uh, brought them along with our uh, regulatory submission in order to uh, make the case for why this is not that different compared to what already uh, exists. That's really helpful. And thank you for being so candid. Uh, I mean, I feel like it's the more you know, <laughs> the more you can do with that information and the more we can move forward together. Uh, so I want to circle back a little bit more about the surgical robotic systems and how ISU is being used to help uh, with the, uh, I guess, the AI-powered vision capabilities is uh, one of the phrases that I had heard you say a little bit before. So how how does that system manage the different complexities like um, tissue movement, for example, and um, maybe like haptic feedback? I know those are kind of two different topics. So one, like in the body, yep. in, in the patient, and the other, the surgeon's uh, interaction. Like how does that assist an overlay? So I think that there are somewhat two different uh, things. I think haptic feedback and the AI part, they are, they, they are two different subsystems. Uh, but when you talk, talk about augmented intelligence and, and camera control, uh, for example, you know, traditionally, uh, without a robot, you would ask your assistant, the surgeon would ask the assistant to move the camera and the assistant would physically move the camera. With a robot, now the surgeon has the ability to stop moving the instruments and then focus and move the camera and then come back to the instruments. With the ISU, what that does is it can see and identify the instruments. So the surgeon can kind of say, okay, I want to go to uh, follow me mode or like autopilot mode. And now what the camera does is the camera will follow wherever you move the instruments. So wherever the surgeon moves the instruments, the camera will follow along. Uh, so that way the, it's, it's one less thing that the surgeon has to do, physically think about. The goal of all of this in, in augmented intelligence is to reduce the cognitive fatigue of the surgeon so that the surgeon has the bandwidth to focus on the critical task of caring for the patient and leveraging the surgeon's years and years of experience to deliver the best care and not have to think about all the background tasks that are happening. So that's what the ISU does, is it takes care of that, saying, okay, camera control, we have that uh, under control. Surgeon, you move the instruments to wherever you want and the camera will follow uh, and, and you can see what you are looking to see because that's where you are at any given point of view. So that's more on the the, the camera uh, front. And then I talked about uh, uh, measurement uh, before. And another feature that's coming up uh, in the near future is being able to identify certain anatomy. Uh, so if you identify the, the cystic duct uh, or the liver or any kind of anatomy, and the surgeon says, oh, this is a critical structure. <clears throat> I don't want to kind of make any mistakes or errors. You can put a margin around it and you can set that as a no-fly zone. So now when the surgeon's operating, even by accident, you will not violate that boundary. So the surgeon has the peace of mind to say, okay, I'm, I'm in a safe space. I know I'm not going to hit anything by accident because these things happen. It's a pretty high, fast pace, high stress environment. And the goal, again, is for us to give the surgeon the peace of mind to say, I, I have the boundaries set and, and I can still focus on it. Because we have these technologies in our everyday life, right? You drive a car, you have lane keep assist, you have backup cameras that automatically hit your brakes before you hit something. So these technologies exist in everyday life, but not in surgery. So that, that's kind of the parallel that we are drawing and trying to bring those uh, safety uh, enhancing features in order to reduce the cognitive fatigue of the surgeon and allowing the surgeon to focus on the critical task. Well, I'm really glad that you reiterated the point of cognitive fatigue. So one of the 
uh, less one of the common themes that I've been learning over my time with AI meets life size, how AI, uh, AI as in artificial intelligence and AI as in augmented intelligence uh, are both supporting uh, workflow, workload, but you, I've never heard cognitive fatigue as being one of those pillars. And it makes so much sense, especially when you're talking about how you're identifying anatomy and you're putting these you know, kind of safe zones in for peace of mind. I mean, that has to alleviate some of this cognitive fatigue that you don't think about. And that's really exciting. That's really, really exciting. So two things that I've already gotten out of our conversation, Anthony, is how more approachable artificial slash augmented intelligence can be when you think about it as augmented and not replacing anything, just adding to complementing. And then the, as I would call it, the intangible effect, which uh, uh, of, you know, cognitive fatigue and reducing that and helping, and this is a phrase I use all the time now, helping humans be more human. So helping surgeons be better at being a surgeon and eliminating um, more of the, the, the areas that would impact the focus or impact the end result. It's really encouraging. So last question for you, Anthony, and this goes in line with the surgeon as well. With this very again, exciting augmented intelligence, um, your enhanced surgical robotic systems, how that can really support the surgeons moving forward in a way that we've never seen before. How do you envision the role of the surgeon evolving? Uh, let's call it in the next five years, because especially with the rate of how artificial and augmented intelligence is moving forward, we don't know what the future is. It could be tomorrow. Uh, so maybe what could the role of the surgeon look like in five, 10 years? Any thoughts? Yeah, great, great question, Karen. I, 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 you know, I, we believe that the surgeons, this technology will help level the field of surgical knowledge and skill. Because surgeons get trained uh, in different places uh, in different countries, different geographies, different settings. Some get extended amount of training, some don't. And uh, so it, the, it, it's, it's very, very, there's a lot of variability in how surgeons get trained. So irrelevant of that training, this technology has the power to normalize that uh, by providing this digital assistance so that surgeons can continue to perform at a much higher level in a predictable fashion. So it, it's really a, a, a move uh, that will over time will drive to a certain level of standardization of surgery. Uh, when you know how to do something really, really well and know what either you can, yes, there are variables uh, because we are humans and we have uh, small, slight differences uh, anatomically, but when you know what good looks like, it will lead to a certain level of standardization. And now that will make the surgeon more effective and with much offer the surgeon a higher level of confidence. And also the surgeon will be productive and be able to uh, have a better balance, uh, you know, work and life uh, balance because, you know, surgeon burnout is something that is increasing. And with uh, these tools that will help address some of these uh, cognitive fatigue, uh, I think it will be a welcome change uh, for the surgeons uh, to have the peace of mind and be able to say, okay, I, I think I've done this case extremely well and I, I can leave for the day and, and feel good about uh, the outcome uh, that's going to be delivered to the patients of all the patients who to, had surgery during the day. Well, here, here. Anthony Fernando, thank you very much for joining us on AI Meets LifeSite. I, I feel lighter <laughs> than I have in a while. This has been such a positive and encouraging conversation. Best of luck and thank you for what you're doing for the medical device industry, for patients at large. We really appreciate again what you and your team is doing and I appreciate your time. Thanks again for joining.
Thank you, Kellen. Really glad to be here. It's always really nice to have the opportunity to listen back to the interviews. And one of Anthony's quotes struck me in particular. Anthony says, augmented intelligence is really about how we can augment the surgeon so that the surgeon can perform at the highest possible level. Okay, so as much as I loved that episode, I'm really excited for you to hear the episode with my colleague, Brian Bunce, where he sits down with Tahseen Syed, GM of Health AI at Amazon Web Services. Take it away, Brian. Hello, I'm Brian Bunce. I'm here with Tahseen Syed from AWS. And I'll be asking some questions about the healthcare business. And just to get started to hear about your role as GM, Health AI, AWS, AI slash ML at AS, was curious if you can give a bit of a backstory on what got you interested in the intersection of healthcare, life sciences, and AI. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's great to be on with you, Brian, and, and thanks for having me. Um, Let's see. So, so first, maybe a little bit about uh, my role as as GM uh, of Health AI at AWS. Um, so, the teams that I have build, deploy, and operate our purpose built services for healthcare and life sciences. So, we're responsible for the product, the engineering, and the business aspects for those services. And our mission is um, kind of the same as the AWS. If you've heard the AWS tagline of remove undifferentiated heavy lifting, what we do and what our purpose is, you know, what our mission is, is to remove the domain specific undifferentiated heavy lifting that a lot of healthcare and life sciences customers have to deal with when using kind of technology um, to to run their business, right? And what I mean by that are things, you know, simple things like maybe um, the undifferentiated heavy lifting that's involved in in uh, storing lots of health data, right? So things like compression and lifecycle management, or in uh, you know for EHR data, things like operating Fire APIs at scale. Fire is the kind of an interoperability standard, the fast healthcare inter interoperability resources. Um, so, you know, operating those APIs at scale or uh, perhaps doing zero ETL transformations of that EHR data into analytics ready formats. Right. So things like that. Um, uh, you can, you know, running secondary analysis uh, uh, of genomic sequences or doing protein structure prediction at scale. You know, how do you do these things and how do you uh, uh, manage the infrastructure and provision it and run it efficiently? Those are kind of the areas that we uh, as, a, as a team uh, within AWS tackle for our customers. So that's that's kind of what we do at AWS. And then um, from my perspective, why I've been uh, interested in, in this is, uh, you know, my whole career has been spell, spent in health technology. I uh, Prior to AWS, I was at a company called Cerner for uh, almost uh, over 23 years. Um, and there, you know, I, I worked in, in various uh kind of capacities within the electronic health uh, record uh, arena, uh, including in many different disciplines uh, across, you know, critical care, population health, et cetera. And I've always, uh, you know, in that whole time seen how uh, kind of how the healthcare industry has maybe not been able to, to harness all of the power of technology to really uh, make the improvements that that other industries have and that's uh and it's such an important area uh you know taking care of patients and and uh ensuring that the the health of populations is trending better than it used to be uh is something that i really believe in and i think that, that we can really make a big difference in through the application of technology so that's why i've spent my whole career uh in this area <laughs> Well, the point that you raised about the undifferentiated heavy lifting, I'm wondering, I imagine that's really important because you have this huge demand for talent in areas like data science and AI, like you know, even within the tech um, space um, as a whole, there's like a lot of competition. So it's difficult for healthcare companies, for drug developers, for hospitals to get access to some of the best talent. Um, given that backdrop, I imagine that ability to kind of remove some of the complexity from a technological perspective can really help organizations to make more progress and mature on the digital spectrum. Like, could you talk more about how AWS works with companies to kind of 
take away some more of the heavy lifting as you alluded to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, we, we're always looking and, and working backwards from our customers' needs, right? And it's exactly as you said, um, customers who want to apply machine learning or AI uh, to healthcare data um, and, and healthcare use cases don't always necessarily have the expertise needed to develop those things from scratch, right? So we look at what are kind of the foundational capabilities that we can provide that really makes it easy uh, for customers to apply those kinds of technologies and techniques to their business, to their, their needs, but without having to develop everything from the ground up. So some, some examples of that are things like, you know, our uh, natural language processing capabilities, right? So we have services like Comprehend Medical that help customers extract um, meaning from unstructured uh, clinical notes or other kinds of uh, documents within uh, the healthcare and life sciences arena, right? So how do you take a document and you process it and get kind of um, medications, uh, test treatment procedures, diagnoses, and link those to actual, like the, the ontologies like ICD-10 or RxNorm, and then make downstream decisions based on that data. That could be, uh, you know, it can take away a lot of manual effort that, that these uh, the customers are, are putting in, uh, and a lot of time that experts are putting in to try to read these documents and extract these insights. Uh, you know, how do we make that faster, easier, and scalable? How do you process hundreds or thousands or millions of documents uh, in an easy way versus deploying kind of uh, humans to read that or building your own systems to do that. So we work with customers to identify what those kinds of problems are that they are tackling and then finding, you know, what is the right technology to help them enable that. So some are like these AI services I talked about, like uh, Comprehend Medical. There's services like, uh, um, you know, HealthScribe, AWS HealthScribe, which is taking... A patient-physician audio consultation, uh, transcribing it, and then automatically generating a clinical note from it. So that really reduces a clinician's burden, on, you know, where they can spend more time with the patient, actually just talking to them, understanding the, the that person's issues, and providing a real, you know, uh, diagnosis and treatment, and then not having to worry about oh, I have to document all this so it can be, you know, so it can be billed correctly. Uh, so that I have it for the next time that I'm seeing this person, all of that is kind of taken care of by this uh, this capability, right? So you, you take away all of that kind of burdensome, undifferentiated work that the clinician is doing. So those are the AI services. In other areas, though, like like research and R and D and and other things, that you know, if you look at uh, what's happened with generative AI and and the, kind of the explosion of that technology over the last eighteen months. Uh, AWS is also looking at how do we make it easy for our customers to really take advantage of this really powerful um, set of capabilities that's evolved, um, but without having to kind of worry about all of the the pieces that that you need to build and develop on your own if if you're going to deploy this, right? So some of that is about security and privacy, like all the the framework, the the, the groundwork, right? That you need, you know, how how you, how can you ensure you can use uh, a foundation model in a secure and, and private way, and then uh, other pieces of that are how do you have access, you know, how do you give your folks access to the best foundation models or a variety of them, um, and how do you do that uh, without, you know, deploying your own huge uh, IT and, and engineering uh, software engineering capability, right? So there we have services like AWS Bedrock. Uh, that are providing customers with the ability to choose between, you know, the latest leading foundation models, models from folks like Cohere and Anthropic and Stability and, and kind of making uh, the ability to access those models just a simple API call and you can do it in a very secure way, right? You can, uh, it's all within your own uh, network, your own VPC, the data is never going anywhere else, you can, you know, it, with peace of mind, use those services. So we kind of operate at many different layers of, uh, let's say, the stack and say, you know, what are, what is the right tool for the capability or the sophistication that a customer has and, and what can they use? So, so those are just some examples of those. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Gen AI and on that point, I think it was research from 
almost a year ago. Well, I guess it was a year ago. It was April 2023 from Capgemini. But I raised it only because they had this factoid about percentage of organizations who agree with them. The statement that Gen AI is a topic of discussion at the board level. And yeah. in pharma slash healthcare was 98%. It was close to that kind of across sectors. In high tech, it was 100%. But anyway, I raise that because in pharma slash healthcare, if you dig down, it's a lot of companies are taking still a wait and see approach. I think it was 40% just about were doing that as opposed to like 58% considered themselves to be strong kind of advocates of Gen AI. So given that kind of backdrop, and I'm sure those numbers have changed over the past year, but I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is for organizations that are a bit kind of like fresher earlier on in their Gen AI, their curious about it, talking about it at the board level. What is your advice for kind of like the first steps and like the data prep strategy that they should kind of get in place to proceed with a more mature kind of strategy with Gen AI? Gen AI? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a very uh, good question. It's, it's super interesting to see how all of our customers are approaching this. And I think um, Gen AI is on an you know, I talk to many, many healthcare life sciences customers, and and it's definitely first and foremost on almost all of their minds, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they're taking a wait and see approach or whether they're diving in, um, it's definitely an area that everybody wants to understand. You know, what should they be doing, and and how should they be proceeding? So, I, I think the first thing I want to do is acknowledge that mature Gen AI deployments are are still pretty rare across all industries, not just healthcare and life sciences, right? It's a the technology has been moving extremely fast and maybe on a daily or weekly basis, there's like huge advancements um, and, and big changes. And, uh, you know, there's there's new models, there's new techniques, there's there's new ways to apply them. So that creates a really difficult, uh, I think, um, landscape for how to get to a you know day to day production use of it. You can certainly do a lot of things, but. How do you get from that to, hey, I'm going to put it in the hand of users uh, and they're going to do their some daily task with it or some set of daily tasks with it, right? So I, I think for those folks that are just getting started, I would say, you know, you have to be clear about the goal that you have in mind. Um, is it is it for, you know, one one way to look at it is that, hey, we want to experiment to determine how our business could be fundamentally transformed by these capabilities. So examples like that could be a pharma company might want to look at how could we shorten the drug discovery cycle, um, you know, with with this capability. Um, but then there could be other ways, like you could be looking at, uh, you know, something much more um, constrained and, and more immediately possible. Like, oh, you know, could I respond to an RFP using generative AI capabilities, or, or could I provide access to my internal knowledge base uh, using generative AI capabilities to all my uh, employees, right? So, so you have to kind of make sure you understand the goal and then, and then look at the framework that you would apply based on that goal. If you're doing experimentation, you know, you have a different kind of way to look at this. You, you can tolerate a lot more ambiguity. You can tolerate a lot more like, okay, I, I, think this will be solved in the future, but it's not solved yet. You know, those could be things like, uh, you know, there's lots of hallucinations. There is, uh, you know, uh, RAG isn't working correctly and you don't have the right embedding model, uh, whatever, right? But but then if you want to do something that's that's much more immediate, then, then you have to look at how do I constrain, uh, you know, the system to be able to actually produce something useful for a user without these, without these problems. Like users are not going to tolerate maybe having a lot of uh, hallucinations or mistakes, they can tolerate some, but certainly not a lot. So what, what guard, guard rules do you have to put in place? So, so once you have that goal and those constraints in mind, then you, then you have to look at, okay, like how do I mitigate the, the, e either the issues I've identified um, or you know, how do I enable this experimentation? So once you have that goal and you can look at those guardrails, then I think you have to decide, okay, what's good enough, right? Like, if you're waiting for perfection, I think that that is probably not where we are uh, in most cases. So you have to make a determination of what's good enough. And good enough could be, you know, you're always going to require, if, if you're automating something, you're always going to require a human review before, you know, you, you do whatever is downstream to the, the automation. 
Um, or it could be that uh, you know you have the right um, the right kind of warnings or or training for your users of here's how to identify you know that that the output that you're getting is is acceptable or, or something like that, right? And and so I think that that is two ways to get started. Um, and uh, but but you have to really have uh, I think the fundamental thing is you have to set your expectations up front uh, and then really uh, proceed with. Uh, identifying kind of what are the parameters that would make you successful in, in achieving that goal. And then, of course, identify the right tools that can get you there, right? So that I talked about, kind of AWS has a lot of offerings. So you've got to make a build versus buy decision. I think many, many, you know, most, I don't know what, I, I won't describe a percentage, but I would say north of 90% of enterprises are not going to go and build their own foundation models uh, and things like that. They're going to go out and look for, okay, how do I get access to state-of-the-art foundation models in a cost-effective way? So then you can look at things like Bedrock, things like uh, Amazon Q. So Bedrock might be more, hey, I have direct access to a model and I want to interact with it. I want to do, you know, kind of retriever-based, knowledge bases. I want to do agent-based things, but I want to do some building myself. Or you could look at uh, other uh, higher tier services, uh, uh, for example, like Amazon Q, which may, uh, which is much more a, a, from an AWS offering perspective. You you just say here is a, a knowledge base that you can point to, and then users can interact with the system in a chat like way. And then the Q service takes care of a lot of the underlying kind of, you know, dealing with processing, indexing, giving you back the good responses. Kind of thing. So then you can identify those tools, and then you can kind of decide: yes, I can deploy this or not deploy this. You mentioned how fast the technology is moving, and it's also hard to keep track of all the potential applications you could use Gen AI for. And given that kind of the fast-moving technology and like the broad base of applications, what is your sense of which areas might have the the most impact in healthcare? Like I can imagine. Like one thing I've not heard about a lot in like the drug discovery space is making better bets, or ma making better bets on certain clinical areas. Like we've seen like a couple of companies have made like bets on the metabolic space have seen like a huge uptick in valuation. But I imagine that Gen AI and like ML and like the ability to predict kind of like demographic um, dynamics could be an interesting area for um, AWS in the coming years. Um, can you kind of speak to? What is your sense of what, what are the more high impact areas for the technology? Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a great question. The I, I think it's going to take uh, you know within within healthcare and life sciences, I, I I would differentiate in two ways. One is I think there's a lot of high impact areas immediately, right? Um, and I think we need to look at what's possible immediately, um, and and that's going to be probably in n not in maybe the core business areas. So it, it, there's there's some things in drug discovery and we can get to that, but it could be much more in, hey, how do I automate, um, you know, uh, submissions to the FDA, right? And how do I, um, how do I look at processing patient reported outcomes in a, you know, at scale? Um, those kinds of things I think are, are much more possible uh, right away, mm -hmm. and and can reduce a lot of friction within these organizations. Like so, it could change the drug, the drug discovery cycle right now. But just based on reducing a lot of bureaucracy and paperwork, and making it much simpler for um, just you know the humans within those organizations that are doing these tasks, make it faster for them. So I think there's ways to be impactful right away if you uh, if you apply it narrowly and with the right safeguards. So kind of what I was talking about before. And then in the long, longer term, like you're saying, I do think, you know, we all know the, the cycle to bring a successful drug to market is, you know, in the, in the decade range and the, you know, in the billion dollar spend range, lots of failures on the way. So the question really is how do you identify, you know, uh, identify and discard the, the, you know, those failures that you were going to have, can you fail much faster? Right. Could you uh, look at these technologies and do the protein structure prediction, do the, the diffusion, do kind of the like antibody predictions, like do all of these things in a much faster experimentation cycle. And I think there, uh, 
that will have huge impact um, from a, a life sciences discovery perspective. So that's one. I think other areas, though, like even uh, in the application, uh, like personalization and uh, of the of the you know therapies, there's a lot of potential application here, right? Um, if you're looking at how do you bring in different modalities of data, uh, like a lot of these models are starting to be very good from a multimodal perspective. So can we envision in the future um, much better kind of identification of the patient and the therapy right match? So if you have the input parameters of, you know, your omics data, imaging data, EHR data, like today, if you think about a lot of oncology treatments, you're going to go through the, pro the first line protocol often before you do the further kind of, okay, I'm going to do the tumor section, then I'm going to understand like it didn't respond to the treatment, uh, and then I'm going to identify the, the much more targeted therapy. Uh, but, you know, could it be possible that, that, that everybody's therapy is personalized? I think that's, uh, that's also an area that uh, these technologies are going to have huge applicability in the future. Could you give an example or two of how AWS's AI services like SageMaker or AWS for Health are being used by either pharma or meta companies now? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so maybe the first uh, one I can talk about is um, we've we've been working with a lot of of pharma and biotech companies, um, and maybe uh, for example, we've been working with with Merck. Uh, who is through HPC and uh, HPC on AWS, so high performance computing on AWS and AWS Health Omics, um, are kind of scaling protein structure prediction within their organization. So w manage workflows uh, to run AlphaFold or ESM fold for uh, their drug discovery and, and then also be able to do molecular dynamics uh, calculations, right? So doing that through our managed services has really improved um, kind of the speed at which they can they can perform like uh, experiments within the organization. And, and what it's also done is freed up kind of scientists from having to deal with these like infrastructure uh, or software engineering IT problems. Right? They can just say be confident that that's all going to work and scale and don't have to spend their time. On, on those considerations, they can just spend much more time on the science and get much more, uh, you know, immediate uh, results and be able to turn those around and experiment with them. And then um, other examples are we've been working with Pfizer and Pfizer is already uh, kind of um, applying generative AI in, in multiple ways. So specifically uh, for, um, you know, for identifying new oncology targets. So today, uh, you know, it's a manual process to aggregate information across a lot of different data sources, and then a human has to kind of collate them and then, un, you know, uh, look at the different scientific content, the scientific studies, and make decisions based on, you know, okay, here's where we want to focus and here's what, where we want to do our experiments. Um, they can do that now in, in a much smaller fraction of time by using uh, generative AI models to do that work for them to shift, uh, sift through that data, to draw kind of their, their conclusions and, and work with the scientists uh, in a natural language interface uh, to kind of get to that um, get to that candidate identification much faster or the the, the pathway much faster. Um, at the same time, Pfizer has also developed an, an internal platform uh, that they're calling Vox that's deployed. Uh, on on some of the best language models that that Bedrock is giving them access to, and that is really much more to do you know to enable uh, employees within Pfizer to be much more productive, like doing things like uh, creating first drafts of patent applications or generating uh, other medical and scientific content. So Pfizer's been doing that work with us, and and they expect to over. Uh, over over you know uh, the next few years, identify use cases that will end up saving them you know over seven hundred fifty million to a billion dollars annually in costs is what uh, they're estimating. So that's been you know that that's been a lot of work that we've we've done. Um, and then uh, the last one I'll mention is we're also working with with Amgen, um, and Amgen has been using uh, generative AI solutions from from Bedrock and SageMaker 
jumpstart to, uh, again, provide assistance to their scientists, researchers, and engineers, um, as well as uh, looking at how to accelerate uh, drug discovery uh, within their organization. I guess a quick but kind of big question to follow up is it seems like, as we talked about in the beginning of the call, like companies like AWS are helping to make the infrastructure easier to use for scientists and for the life science companies. I'm curious if you could say more on kind of the role that you see AWS playing in kind of streamlining infrastructure, because I, I guess where I'm going in part is because I'm imagining like the high performance computing example that you gave. I've heard anecdotes about how you could free up scientists that you mentioned and radically accelerate sometimes like um, experiments. Like I've heard anecdotes from like going from like day, sorry, months to days in some cases. But um, yeah. could, could you talk a bit more about kind of like how you can kind of get to those kind of hard to imagine gains where you're like accelerating vastly like experiments or clinical trial protocols, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, maybe one concrete example of this is um, the, the work that that scientists are doing, they they have to kind of look at, okay, um, I'm, I want to do this particular protein structure prediction, um, and then I have to analyze those results. Uh, and then I have to make a decision of was this successful or not. And then I, then I, then I go back and say, okay, it wasn't. So now I'm going to do the next thing. And then, you know, th there's a, there's kind of a loop there, right? Like, mm -hmm. and the human is in that loop. Um, but one of the things these technologies can do is uh, assess many at once, right? So the idea is that you can do, you know, if you could previously do one experiment every few days with the whole loop, maybe now you can do a thousand of them in that same time frame because the technology that we're talking about is able to, uh, first, like just the blocking and tackling, it's the managed capabilities that are able to scale uh, seamlessly and say, yeah, I can run, you know, a thousand of these versus one of these at a time. Uh, and I can do it without, you know, the customer or the scientist having to run each job uh, and then look at the results of each job and so on. You know, I can run the thousand jobs at once. and I, So that's just basic stuff. But then, um, but it's important. It's basic, but it, it, it significantly speeds up uh, the, the, the workflow that, that these folks have. But then also, you know, how can you apply generative AI technologies to help assess the outcomes of that, right? And that, I think, is if you can summarize and, and point um, uh, scientists to the, the right areas, like these models can say, okay, you know, this was viable, this wasn't viable uh, based on, on criteria that, that are built into the models themselves, then it makes that assessment much faster as well. So that is part of the reason we think that these things have been much, uh, you know, can be sped up a lot. And we're starting to see that. Like, it's not, it's not a panacea and it's not happening at scale across the board yet. But certainly there's pockets in which those improvements are being seen. Um, so that's, you know, that's part of, of why we, we believe and what we're seeing in our customers can really improve the speed at which um, these experimentations are done. It's not a panacea, but it's also exciting to hear about some of these anecdotes of companies that are cutting certain processes in half. Like I've heard about that happening in the clinical trial space. Um, and it seems like that's an area, you kind of alluded to this before a couple of times, but it seems like a big area for Gen AI to help accelerate things. Could you speak a bit more on what you're seeing in the, the clinical trial space with them, Gen AI? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, you know, there's a few things here in clinical trials. One of the things that I think um, is is key is how do how do we um, identify? You know, uh, how do we do better protocol design? How do we uh, identify? Um, you know, better ways to recruit patients and retain patients in the trials. That's that's really important, right? So traditionally, you know, these uh, were very manual designs and you have to kind of, it's very hit and miss, right? You, you've got to go broad and try to recruit lots and lots of folks um, and then hope that you have enough people for your study and that they're going to stick around throughout the study. Um, so, so what we can do here is there's a wealth of information out there already from previous studies, from clinical systems uh, that have uh, a lot of information about patients, right? 
So uh, these systems, the AI, AI systems we're talking about, can can again can learn from that information and really say, okay, if you know, looking at your previous 500 studies that were similar to this idea, these are the kinds of patients uh, that um, that you should recruit, and these are the kinds of patients that might stay, you know, have a higher probability of being retained throughout the study. So the idea here is that if you can really make those decisions more efficiently and, and make those predictions, then you have much more successful and much more efficient studies because you may have identified a way to, you know, increase the retention uh, rate by 10% or 15%. And that's a big, big difference to, uh, to a study, right? Um, and to the successful conclusion of the study. So those are areas that that we think um, are are going to be very important. And so, some specific things that we've done, uh, you know, for example, we worked with Fred Hutch, uh, who used um, Comprehend Medical to help identify patients for clinical trials uh, that could benefit from specific cancer therapies. And the way that was done is they applied uh, the NLP capability to look across millions of clinical notes, extract and index the conditions, medications. Uh, the choice of therapeutic options, and then um, it, instead of you know manually processing each document that like it, you know documents probably take a human tens of minutes to process, the NLP capability is processing it in seconds and is processing millions of those in a batch, right? So suddenly you can reduce that time and 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 you can really use all of that information then to make to make the predictions. So that's something uh, they they saw success with. I also think we can start applying newer capabilities here. So AWS um, at reInvent announced this. Uh, if you've heard of AWS Clean Rooms, uh, that was announced earlier the year before at reInvent. But at, at reInvent this year, we announced in preview this uh, Clean Rooms ML capability. And the idea there is that participants who don't necessarily want to share data uh, can put their data in a clean room and they can uh, run inference or analysis on that data without sharing the underlying data, right? So in this case, you can think about applications like a, a health system and then a, a, a pharmaceutical, and the, the pharma company or the, bio, bio, the biotech company may have identified a way to say, hey, these are the kinds of patients I want to recruit but the patients are all in kind of the hospital system or, or somewhere else, right? So if they both put their data in clean rooms and you run this ML algorithm that says, okay, I see, you know, you want patients like these, then the health system without sharing that patient data, which is a big barrier, right? Like in terms of sharing private data uh, to identify these things, they can, they can do it without sharing the underlying data and they can say, okay, I have, you know, patients that match this criteria, maybe then we can like approach them, get consent, see if they want to opt into this trial or not, but really improve, uh, you know, reduce the friction there too that uh, exists in terms of trying to get all of the um, frameworks in place to share data and then have somebody else analyze that data. We really take that away and just say, hey, you can just run this in a way that there is no access to the discrete data from that, that's owned by either party, but you get the result that you want, which is you can identify patients much faster that might be suited for the trial. Well, it seems like that technology too has interesting applications potentially for clinical care, where if a doctor has a patient that's in like a narrow demographic that wasn't in a clinical trial, they could then go out and see if there were records out there of patients that were similar to that, and they could get a sense of how well a, a drug did in that patient population. So it yeah. seems like an interesting kind of possibility there. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it, it was just uh, that, you know, it, it was just announced and it's, it has applications across multiple industries, but we believe there's going to be a lot of application in kind of these, uh, these use cases in healthcare and life sciences. So maybe a final question and you can pick a time frame, but I think I had jotted down like five years plus, that's impossible to predict, but given this technology, Gen AI, and like kind of all the different domains of AI and machine learning are evolving so fast, it's hard to say definitively, but what is your sense of kind of where things are headed with AI and healthcare and slash life sciences in the coming months and years? <laughs> yeah. It's a big it's question. A, <laughs> no, uh, it, it's a, you know, it's a question that we think about all the time because it's important to, you know, we, 
you kind of the AWS way is to look around corners and understand where thing where are we going and what can we build for our customers that will help them, you know, get to that 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 future uh, state. So, you know, I have I have a few ideas here. One is clearly it's about um, I think precision and personalized medicine. So um, this kind of if you've seen our investments from an AWS perspective, we're really in investing specifically in, in optimizing each modality of healthcare data. Uh, so things like medical imaging, omics, uh, genomics and multi-omics, uh, electronic health clinical, you know, structured and unstructured health data. How do you store, query, analyze each of them optimally? But then uh, I think the real power is going to be in how do you bring together those data sets to be able to do personalized medicine at scale, right? And I think what, what one of the things that I see for uh, the next you know, five, five years, 10 years is this ability to really seamlessly use kind of you know, cell-based imaging data, like digital path data, and your clinical health data and like look at, you know, tumor progression, just have machine learning or AI be looking at, okay, like, how are you responding to a therapy? No, we, we should recommend a different therapy because this one is not responsive, but making much faster decisions than what's possible today, right? Because you're looking at all of the, uh, all of the data uh, that is all of the longitudinal data for a patient and really making recommendations based on that and processing it and, and doing that. So I think I see a lot more of those. And what, one of the, um, maybe I was looking before this interview, one of the, the stats that I think helps bear this out is if you've looked at the FDA medical device uh, AI algorithm approvals in the US, there's about, I think as of end of last year, there's 700 uh, algorithms that have been um, approved. But the, to me, what was interesting is the first algorithm was approved in 1995. Uh, it was for uh, kind of cervical cancer, like it was called PAPnet, and and for so how to interpret kind of uh, Pap smear data and and make uh, predictions based on that. From 1995 to 2017, less than 100 were approved. Since 2017, so 2018 onwards, the rest of the five or 600 have <laughs> been approved. So and and those are all primarily radiology and image processing, like 80 percent of them. But I, I think clearly there is a huge kind of step function here, like an acceleration in the application of these technologies to, uh, to, to healthcare and life sciences, right? And so I think we will see a continuation of that and we will see, uh, uh, you know, obviously the precision personalized uh, medicine, but also a lot more algorithms around, let's say, predicting um, the, the, the health of, uh, an individual, right? And and early interventions, like, can you look at this data and can you develop systems that say, hey, if you took these actions now, then you would change your risk profile in this way, but specific to you, right? We, we see that all the time. You know, you get lots of advice on, on how to eat or how to exercise or things like that. But the thing about that is they're not, it's mostly generic advice, right? Based on really big studies, but it's not personalized advice. So how can that change? How can it say for you, based on your genetic and environmental factors, this is what, what you should do? So I think we'll see some of that as well. And then I think we'll see an acceleration in R&D. So we've talked about this uh, today, but I think we will see, you know, we've seen new, new antibiotics being uh, proposed and created by uh, the application of AI systems. That's incredibly exciting. Like we've all, the antibiotic re resistance is a huge issue, right? And so to be able to create a novel antibiotic uh, is amazing. And if that is being driven by AI, then what, you know, I think that you'll see a lot more from a vaccine perspective, from a therapy perspective, being driven by um, kind of these AI systems. And um, obviously the humans are going to have to interpret that and, and, and get to conclusions, but I expect that there, it'll be accelerated and maybe in five to 10 years, you know, maybe we can bring drugs to market in, in three to four years instead of 
10 to 12 years, right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's one to two years. Like the Moderna vaccine, obviously those are extraordinary conditions, but you know, they came, that came to life much, much faster. So could we get to a 12 month cycle? I, you know, that would be amazing. Um, so I think across the board, those are all things that, that are, are really important. But I, I think to get there though, there's a lot of problems we have to solve I, still, right? And I think in these technologies, generative AI or AI in general, um, we've got to uh, focus more on, on the transparency of these systems, ensure that they, you know, they are correct from an equity perspective, right? So that they're not, um, you know, biased or toxic in, in ways uh, that, that a standard evaluation frameworks are out there. You see lots of things for medical foundation models uh, around passing, you know, the USMLE and things like that. But is that really the right evaluation framework? Uh, you know, it's unclear. Probably not. So what, what's a better one? Like, how do we actually talk about this in, in the public, uh, you know, like in a public way of how do you benchmark these things uh, for, the thing, for the tasks that they're doing? And then finally, I think we'll see a lot more, uh, you know, regulatory frameworks that actually can help guide uh, these capabilities. Because I talked about the FDA approvals. Uh, but I think there's a, a lot that will still need to happen to apply these technologies safely. Well, I think we'll have to leave it there, but I really enjoyed hearing your perspective kind of across the, the AI landscape as it pertains to healthcare. So once again, thanks for your time. Um, great interview and look forward to staying in touch. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. It was great talking to you as well. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for spending your time listening to Device Talks AI. I really hope that these medtech conversations have helped inspire and inform. I mean, that's really ultimately our goal. My name is Kayleen Brown. I'm the managing editor for Device Talks. And please, as a favor, connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me K A Y L E E N Brown, just like the color on LinkedIn. And please send me a, a message. Tell me your metric story. I mean, we're always looking for innovative advancements and stories that help our device makers build better devices. Once again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for supporting Device Talks. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Device Talks on your favorite podcast platform and on YouTube and check out devicetalks.com so you can see our Device Talks Spotlight, our Device Talks Tuesdays webinars, and learn more about the upcoming conference this October, Device Talks West. That's at west.devicetalks.com. We'll see you next time and thanks again.